That's right, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, this is the part two that everyone's been asking for. And again, uh, let me apologize for the delay in getting it to you. Uh, especially, I want to put a shout out there to the Autumn for Love and uh, Andrea Johnson. Uh, you guys, I do apologize. I have had a, a whirlwind of events with trying to get my workspace um, organized as well as a little renovation going on and that takes some time unfortunately so I got kind of pulled away from doing these um, videos and I, again no real excuses other than that I mean it's like a hurricane went off in my workspace so today I'm doing it from my classroom space um, I have some vintage sewing machines so this is a real treat um, this right here is one of my vintage Kenmore's and that's what I'm going to be using in this part two of the glamour bonnets I did put the video back on to refresh my memory as to where we left off. And where we left off was I had finished the top part of the bonnet and had done the gathering stitches and had taken it off the machine and was in the process of gathering those stitches to fit it to the headband portion. So this is not the same material I used in the uh, part one. Um, this is a camouflage version. It has camouflage on the one side and then the green satin on the other. The one that I was working on in part one was this one with the Falcons sports fabric and with the black satin lining, as you can see, the headband and for an extra touch. And you can do this too or you can just leave it. You can leave it plain like on the inside. But I thought it could use a little bit of a grow gain ribbon across, the, across it. So what's really good about doing something like this is it gives it an extra special touch. And also, if for some reason you just have some stitches that are kind of out of line and you don't want to tear them out and redo it, you can cover them up. Cover them up with a little bit of grogan ribbon. You can put anything over top of it, really, uh, satin ribbon or whatever. And uh, that's that. This is the, I call it the traditional um, elastic band kind of bonnet. You know, it's just, just gathered with the elastic in the casing inside. Um, this one has a cotton exterior instead of being satin and satin, but it is still reversible, just like all the rest of them that I make. And there's the same falcon fabric there with the red satin in the center, in, on the inside, excuse me. Goes back on here. And then I get real creative and I'll do, like I told you, I found the pattern for um, the Simplicity 1020 pattern that has the scrubs and has these type of bonnets on it with the headband uh, version. Um, I made some for hospital staff. I put the name of the hospital on it. They're cotton on the inside and cotton on the outside because in the hospital setting you can't have the satin. It's something about sterility. I mean, you can take cotton and throw it in a sterilizer and it's perfectly fine. Um, this has little hospital type print items on it. Um, Crutches, stethoscope, wheelchair, band-aids. It's really cute. And um, if you want to personalize one for gifts, and this makes great gifts, by the way, and we've got Christmas coming up. Since I have my uh, brother PE800 and I'm enjoying it so much, we can do things like this, where you can embroider on the headband portion. Now you want to embroider this before you cut it out. So in other words, get the big enough piece of fabric that will be the size of the pattern for the headband, do your embroidery on it, and then place the pattern over where it's, your, your embroidery will show up where you want it to in the center. So I did this on one side. And on the other side, we have the royal colors, purple and gold here. And then on the other side, just the reverse, gold with purple. Okay. All right, back to the one that we were in the process of, of making. Um, one really good thing to have when you're trying to keep your seams consistent as far as width goes is there is a hem, hem width foot. It's, it's, it's about three inches across and it has little red lines on it um, to help you, you know, line it up because it's clear like this little guy here. See, it's the same kind of thing. This is a seam foot. It's a clear seam foot and it has the little red line so that if you do one seam at, at that red line, that's where your needle's going to hit it. When you go to do, for the gathering stitches, it's perfect. 
because then you put that little red line where the stitches are and then it makes the next line. So best investment you can make is in one of these. Um, also, whenever you're looking for these feet, make sure that you know whether your sewing machine is a high shank or low shank foot uh, sewing machine. The way you can tell is that when you have your presser foot down, if from this, where it screws onto, to the plate, the needle plate, is less than an inch, it's a low shank. If it's higher than an inch, if it's an inch and a half, then that's a high shank. If it's a little bit more than that, like one and three quarters, that's a super high shank. There aren't too many of those. I have. I actually have a machine I didn't know was a super high shank, and it's an old Kenmore, an old experimental Kenmore, as a matter of fact. So those are kind of unique, but they're great to work with because it's called a slant shank. So instead of the feet coming straight down, it kind of slant. They're so wonderful. So look, look around for those. All right. So we've taken the, um, I'm going to take this piece off here so I can show you what I was doing. We're taking the bonnet portion off. Oh, this is a, another great tool. This little heavy duty magnet dish, you won't lose any needles in this thing. And if you drop one on the floor, you just go, boop, picks it right up. Um, I got this in a kit. It was a kit for cars, for working on cars. It was this and a, a, a magnetic wand and a couple other magnetic items. I gave the other items to my husband. I just wanted the bowl. And I didn't want a big bowl. I just wanted a little one. And I um, wish they sold the little ones. They don't sell the little ones by themselves. Or I haven't found out where to find them. Anyway, so this keeps things from, you know, falling on the floor especially needles, have like little pieces like this, you know, they don't go anywhere. Put them in there. Okay. They didn't even pick up the whole box of, of pins. <laughs> That's a strong magnet. Now I will use typically the longer quilting pins when I'm pinning. And remember I said I'm an avid pinner and I am. So I've already pinned my headband to the main portion of the bonnet. As you can see, I've got it pinned, and you pin right side to right side. Now, when you make them reversible, do not make, unless you want it to look this way, <laughs> do not make the mistake of putting the wrong print to the wrong side. I have to visualize and think like, okay, when I go to sew this, when I fold it back out, I need to make sure that the camouflage is next to the camouflage, just like your camouflage to camouflage. And then the satin, which is going to go to the inside, is satin to satin. So when you're doing the headband portion of this type of bonnet, you have already sewn the front portion, which is the, I call it the half moon shape. The half moon shape portion, you've already pinned, you know, sewn if you're doing reversible. If you're not doing reversible, this is all going to be one piece. And you're going to sew that to the band part that goes around the back that the elastic goes into. Now, the other thing you can do also, if you don't want to use elastic in the back, you want to be able to cinch it up as tight as you want or loose as you want, you can always do two things. You can use either a piece of ribbon, which, which just makes it really easy because you don't have to seam anything. All you do is take this put it through like you would do your elastic, and then just have extra, about a good 12 inches hanging down extra on both ends, and use that, cinch it up however loose or tight you want. Um, that's one option. Um, the other option is if you wanna stay in the mode of the same fabric, you know, using it through the whole thing, um, you can take either the satin, I chose the, the, uh, the non-satin side as to make the tie for, and you can take a strip about three inches wide. This is what I did here of the camouflage. I took three inches wide. I folded it in half. I pressed it. Then I took each end, each side, and folded it into the center. I don't know if you can see that. Fold into the center and fold that over. And then you just stitch and close that up. And then that's what you put through the casing and in place of the elastic. You can do it that way. Um, it's basically you're making your own double 
double wide fold bias tape in a sense. It's just not bias. It's just a straight you know, strap. We'll put it in there. Okay. Um, before I actually get to that, the, there is a really cool kit that you can get on Amazon.com and it comes with these little guys. These are elastic pullers. These are great. I was always using a safety pin to put into the end of the elastic and it takes forever with a small, you know, safety pin's only this big. These guys are nice and long. You actually, and I'll show you when I do this, you put elastic through here. It doesn't come out. You put it through and it takes about half the time. A lot of people um, complain about having to turn things inside out from, you know, from right sides together, that sort of thing. And this is one way to get past that with the elastic. But when it comes to taking a narrow, a really narrow tube of, of uh, fabric, like for a real thin spaghetti strap, you got to have one of these. This will save you a lot of yelling at yourself, at the fabric, at the needle, out of, out of everything. It has a little tiny hook on the end right there and you can really turn something inside out a lot quicker with this little guy. Get one of these. It's great. It's a fabric turner. Okay, that's enough of that. All right, so we've got our headband front portion and the back portion it's already been sewn together and we're going to sew it to the top of the bonnet now i always start at the front side seam so let's say here's your head here's the headband i'm gonna show you on this one there's your headband when you go to sew this to the main body of it, start at this seam and go all the way around. Let's turn that way. Let's see, we want to go here. The other thing too you want to remember is when you are sewing these two different types of material, one's a print, one's a solid, make sure that the thread that you're using Keep in mind what you're going to do last as far as top stitching goes. So on this one, my top stitching is going to be the, um, the green satin. So what you want to do is you don't want to have the dark thread on the light side and the light side on the dark side, unless you want to. But, you know, for appearances sake, I like them to kind of blend in. And uh, so that's how I do it. So let's get this going. I love how quiet this machine is. And this machine is uh, 1967, I believe. Yeah, right. So it's better than any new sewing machine. The reason for that is the older machines were made of metal. Um, after 1984, sewing machines started having more and more plastic added to them. And from a retail standpoint, it was cheaper for the manufacturers. They got more profit. They could ship out more because it was less weight. All those things. So I've had some little fiascos with surgery timing going crazy. And that holds things up. So, yeah. If you take care of your machines and your maintenance are regular, then you don't have a whole lot of that going on, which is what we want. We don't want to have to keep fixing stuff just to sew something. No, I don't. Around and around we go. And then you'll see why I love that little magnet dish in just a second. So we're getting here to the end of this. Always, 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 
at the end of a seam, beginning of a seam, stitch forward a couple stitches and backward a couple stitches. It's called locking your stitch. Okay? And that's that. Now also, in addition to that, always pull your fabric out to the side or to the back. Do not pull the material toward you. It can mess up the needle and bobbin timing, especially if you're working on thicker uh, materials. Thick materials are notorious for messing up timing on machines if you don't let the machine do the work. So we're gonna, and you wanna snip your threads as you go, like that. Now, I'm gonna take this lovely little magnet and just put these in here. Now, sometimes what I will do, and I don't have my ironing board set up out here, is I will press this out. And what that does is two things. It gives you a crisp appearance on it right off the bat. It's not like, not like when you throw on your pajamas and run out the door kind of thing. This way it looks like you're, you took the time to be, have the polished look, hence the name Glamour. <laughs> but now if you noticed, I haven't, I haven't done anything to those gather stitches and they're still in there and that's okay. It's all right that they're still in there. And there's a reason I leave them in there sometimes. Sometimes it helps add strength, especially when you're working, say, with satin. You can leave them in there because you're gonna you're not gonna see them anyway. And the ones that you do see, you can cover up. So the goal is is to make your seam all the way around as even as possible. You don't have to clip any corners because there isn't any. It's round. Get all these guys out there. Yes, I did do a lot of pinning. Now, when you flip it out this way, if you do see gather stitches, like I said, you can just pull them out. Because um, all they were there for was to get the fabric ready for you to sew it. And that's also, that's how you find pins that you didn't know you missed. They will poke you. I'm going to stab my fingers about 12 times a day doing this stuff. But anyhow, now you can see you know, on this one, you can actually see the, the gather stitches that I have there. Now, I don't have my seam ripper out here, and I'm not going to go grab one. <laughs> but all you do with that is where you see the end, where you'll see a loop. You can pull up, just pull it up like that to get to a tail of the gathered stitch thread, a good inch or so, enough to grab onto. And because it's a gathered stitch and there's no tied off end, there's no back stitching on the ga gathered stitch, it just kind of, I just wrap it around my finger and I slowly pull it through. And when you pull the gathered thread through, the fabric stays where it's supposed to, but the stitches are gone. That's the whole point. You're pulling out the gathered stitches because you don't want to see them. Now what happened with the one that, that, that I did finish and put the white Grogain ribbon on there, there were some stitches that I really didn't like how they looked, so I thought, oh, I'll just gussy it up a little bit, make it a little bit special. And that's why I put the ribbon on there. But it's a good way to add an extra touch and actually give it a better look. Now, a lot of times, I'll start with pulling out the gathered stitches on top, but you can always flip it to the back side and get them from there, because sometimes you have a longer tail on the back. They're all connected, so you just, like this one. No, oh, this is good. See, this is a real long one. This is going to take the whole row out. Look at this stuff. This is wonderful. And then, when you do the back, and you flip it to the front, you'll find the piece that that went to, that it was connected to, and it all came up. So now all those gather stitches are gone. They're, they're not there, but it's still together because I did a permanent seam on the inside. Okay, so after you've done that, I mean, you can leave the gather stitches till when you're done done instead of doing it in the middle like I just did, which that's up to you. It's, it's our personal preference. So since I make mine reversible, when I put the two materials together, I purposely press this open and then give it a good crisp press like this okay because that way 
Because when I sew this to the underside, I want that to look finished, as finished as possible. Now sometimes, and if you want to do it, you can, in order to make it lay down, you can do a real tiny stitch along the edge to keep it looking crisp and, and, and flat, but you don't have to. So on this side, um, what we're gonna do is clip it to the inside. Key point with this is, and I don't know if I'm gonna have time to finish it, finish it, but that same side seam that I was telling you about by the top of the headband, no, oh, the side seam, when you pin this, you want to leave an opening. And the reason why you want to leave an opening is that's where either your elastic's going to go, your drawstring's going to go. Now, if you do the drawstring, drawstring version of it with the ribbon or this, you're going to want in the center of the back, the center of the back here, you'll leave an opening there. On either side leave about an, a one inch opening that you will not sew shut and that way when you go to put your ribbon through both ends will come out that bottom and then you can tie it off what you will do differently is the portion that doesn't get sewn shut you're gonna stitch across the top of it that inch wide so that way it'll have it'll have an opening but it won't fray on you um, and it'll still be functional what I'll do is I'll make one up with that kind of um, opening for the back for those of you who, who want to have a drawstring version and um, that way you'll be able to see it. I'm a visual person so I understand. Okay, so now I'm turning in my band portion to the inside. Now the trick here is you want to, now two things. You want to make sure, number one, that the seam on the inside is not showing. You want to make sure that is not showing, okay? So you're going to fold under about a 3 8 inch peak part, the 3 8 inch from the edge, and turn that under. You're going to pin it. And... You're going to do that all the way around. Now, what you do also is, the reason why you start at the seam is because, because remember I said it kind of like stretches, it's slippery, the satin is? Well, this way, it starts it off where it's supposed to be. And it doesn't, as you pin it along, it's not going to slide. And it, your pins will keep it from sliding and, and getting, like, sideways for when you finish sewing it. So we're going to pin this around. Now, the only stitches I'm seeing that are kind of hanging out here, that they're the gather stitches. So then that would be something you can go back and just pull those out. Um, I get dull pins in there, I don't know. Anyway, so we're gonna do this. And then we're gonna go this way. Yeah, these are, um, they're little, there's a little more involved to them. I like challenges, so I decided I'm going to use this pattern, but it doesn't show me how to do reversible, but I'm going to do reversible. And I took the time to figure out, okay, to have two different materials on one pattern piece, you have to have the pattern in half. Well, when you do it in half, you have to add additional fabric me measurage. In other words, the headband piece at the widest point could be four inches. Well, you want that, you need that for that total four inches to make the pattern the way it's supposed to look. So what you do is you add a seam allowance to make up for that. So what I did with this piece, the satin piece and the camouflage piece was I took the pattern, I folded it in half and then when I cut cut it out, I cut it on a fold. No, no, I did not. I did not cut it on a fold. I cut it so that where that pattern is folded in half, that edge, I cut an additional three-eighths inches out from it. So I went three-eighths inches out 
to get to have the extra room to sew the two together. If that makes sense. I have to show you that too. Darn. I didn't even think about it till just now because, you know, and when you got one of these crazy creative brains like me, um, you figure stuff out and you just run with it. And boy, do I run with it. When I started making these, I thought they look so cute. And I couldn't give them a plain old name. I said, they, they, there's a little bit of glamour to them. So I, that's why I call them my glamour bonnets. Let's get this other seam over here. And the other thing too, which I just forgot as I was doing, I just remembered. When you are folding this over, this headband portion over to the inside, be sure that you are taking your time, number one, and that because the front is the gathered portion, you want to go halfway from the one side side seam and then go from the other side seam but to meet it in the middle. Why? Everybody wants to know why. The reason why you do it that way is because if it should pucker at all, and it shouldn't, but if it does, this way you can ease it in to smooth it out. And you do that by hand. You just kind of smooth it out as you go. That's why as I'm pinning this, I am using, I'm a lefty, sorry guys. <laughs> I'm a left-handed person. Um, I use this in my right hand as my, kind of like a clamp and keep it at the crease going so I know exactly how much to turn under to cover up the stitching on the inside. Okay, so we're gonna do that. I'm gonna do a little bit of this. I got people buzzing my phone and wanting to buy sewing machines and stuff like that. And my phone doesn't stop ringing. That's another, another thing when you uh, retire and you go into business with yourself, you realize how many people really like the stuff you do. And then you don't get any sleep. <laughs> That's okay. You gotta do something when you're retired, right? You just sit around. Eat peanut butter sandwiches and soup but anyway I actually had uh, a grilled peppered ham and cheese sandwich today that's really good anyhow so that's what I mean by right here I went from one half to the other side one half to the middle excuse me center and then went to the other side seam and went from that side seam to the center. And it is wanting to pucker. And that's the satin doing that. But this way, if I take my little fingers here and I ease it in, it won't be that way. Because I'm able to do this little kind of half moon stretch thing. And on so if it does do that and it's not really bit, no it's not it's, it's laying pretty pretty flat except for this one spot so what you're then what you do is you're going backwards because what when you I call it eyeball tuck under because sometimes when we cut the pattern out it's not completely even with the cutting line and that's actually, if it's a little bigger, that's a good thing because it gives you stuff to work with, room to work with. Um, so as I come back, that's, I can adjust it to the other side. So because it's a gathered back on this, this uh, particular bonnet, the back of it is gathered, um, that's okay. Um, in the gathers, you're not gonna see any um, puckering anyway. So, I'm going to go like this. Actually, I need to tuck it in a little bit more. I know you're not supposed to put pins in your mouth, but I'm an old 40, 40 plus year old. Yeah, I'm, I'm a lot older than 40, but I've been doing this for over 40 years. So, I tend to do the old school stuff with sticking pins because I don't like sitting them down. I don't like loot, you know, because like, I know where it's is right there in my, in my lips. Ouchie. I told you I was going to stick myself. 
Mm -hmm. Like this, and like this, and that one is to, this is a way to just kind of smooth out the rough spots. Just like this. Now I put my thread in the machine the wrong way. Oh, it's gone. I meant to put the light color on top. And I put it in reverse. I was thinking right brained again. I mean left brained again, excuse me. When you're left handed, you think with your right brain. Okay. So there it's it's nice and pinned. Okay. Now for the rest of the way around, like I said, when you're doing the elastic insert, now I do a lot of eyeball. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've done this so long that I do a lot of eyeballing of things, but that's why I use the pinking shears on the on the satin because this stuff frays like crazy. But if yours it's nice and even and straight all the way around, you can, and I do suggest that, that you should, take the edge. You can either finger press it or iron press it, but take about a quarter of an inch, about a quarter of an inch, take your iron, press it down. So that way when you go to do this part, over it, you won't have to fuss with it like I do. Um, the other thing too, and I just as I was pinning the band on it, when you're pinning the band on, you want to make sure that the seam, the seam that we use, so the band to the uh, the top of your ba uh, bonnet, that it faces out. In other words, you don't want your seam to come down like this when you're trying to pin it. You want it going away. From the main part of your fabric and that's so with any seam when you're pressing a seam you're pressing it away from the body it's rule of thumb um believe it or not there is a reason for that it makes it lay better it lays flat it lays crisp who knew that's what they taught us anyway but anyhow so here i'm kind of eyeballing what i'm doing but all the while Making sure that where I pin it, I'm going to try to do this without pinning it. Oh my goodness. But I'm going to pin it for a little while. I just can't let go of my pins. Okay. You're going to pin it. That's that quarter inch I told you just fold on it. And you're going to pin it so that that covers that stitching. The permanent stitching. Not the gathered stitching, but the permanent. But there's no gathered stitching on the revert. The the back side of the bottom, there's no gathered stitching. Just It's just in the front. So we're gonna do this. Now what I'll do is sit, stitch the portion that has the headband and then stop and go to your side seam. Go out an inch and start an inch out. Go all the way around the back and stop at an inch before the next side seam. So let's see, we wanna go Let's see how good I can do this. Because <laughs> I have my thread in here backwards, so I might not like my stitches, so I would actually reverse the threads at this point because I realized what I did. But anyhow, we're gonna go right here. And what you're sti where you're stitching is as close to where the material comes out as you can so almost almost like um, quilting you heard the term stitch in the ditch well you're basically going to be stitching in the ditch on the outside so that you don't see the stitches on the outside so if that makes sense and if I pin it right it'll show up on the other side exactly where it's supposed to so I'm gonna see if I did right so I'm gonna line it up one more time Come here, you. right in the ditch the ditch being where the two fabrics meet. It's, it's the valley where the two fabrics meet. And that's where you're going to stitch it. Do not do this like a Speedy Gonzalez. It's not a race. <laughs> it is definitely not a race. You want your stitches to be as unnoticeable as possible, actually. Oh, you sped up on me, uh-huh. 
these vintage machines are great. Sometimes they have mind of their own though. Almost there, bub. Okay. Okay, now I'm at the other side seam. And what am I gonna do? I'm going to walk my stitch. Back stitch a couple, go back forward a couple more, and always turn your wheel towards you, never away from you. Lift it up. And snip this off. Try to snip as you go. Sometimes I get like kind of crazy, got a lot of things going on and I'll snip at the end, that's a pain. Honestly, it is a pain. It's better to snip as you go. Now, oh, almost. I have one spot that kind of messed up, but that's okay. I'm gonna put a pin there and I'll fix that. Now I can either hand whip stitch that spot that's messed up or I can uh, do it by the machine. It's not going to hurt the other side. For the mere fact, the other side is dark. That's why I picked dark for one side and light for the other. But I should have changed my thread, which I didn't do. Which I did not do. So that needs fixed there. Okay. That, that's not too bad. So I'll show you just in a second what that looks like. Sorry this video is so long, but I feel like I, if I don't explain stuff, I'll miss something. It's just how I am. It's like this is a spot where I missed. So all I need to do is pull that out. And see, I did it again, didn't I? Sorry. And pull that down just a smidgen. That. And that there was another spot that didn't quite cover it up. So what you're you're doing is you're making sure that the uh, any gathered stitches or the permanent stitch in there that it is covered up and it's look for the most part it looks wonderful doesn't it and then on the other side now see I have gathered stitches that I got I know I have to pull so when I did the gathered stitches for this the dark fabric I used the lighter thread so I could see it easier so I could pull it out because once you pull the gathered stitches out it does lay a lot better and, it, and that's the purpose of it it's supposed to it's supposed to help it lay better but I will get those later on. Now to go around the rest of it, I'm going to be daring. I think I need, no, I don't have another bob do I? Oh well. This is going to be tricky, but anyhow, I'm going to show you how to put it in there anyhow. So you fold it under, make sure that you line up that over top, and then you're gonna go all the way around. And I'm not gonna do it in this segment because it's it's uh, just takes an awful lot of time. So what I'm doing is I stopped at my headband part. I'm going out an inch from there so that I have a place to put the elastic in. Okay. So that started. Get in there. Oh, wrong side. Silly me. Should have started up from this side. That's my left, my left side of my head. I'm arguing with my right side of my head again. <laughs> I should have pinned this. Let me pin this real quick. Now the elastic um, that I use is, as I said before, non-roll elastic. Non-roll elastic has more strength to it. Does not deteriorate as fast and it doesn't roll up so you don't have twisties twisty turnies of elastic in your garments you definitely don't want those on your neck or your head that's no fun i'm making sure that my uh, fabric seam is turned up away from the head away from the neck so that it will lay proper and let's go like this. So, I need to do it this way. There we go, pinning it on the wrong side. Oh well. Anyhow, if you use bigger pins, the, the ideal pins to use 
so that your machine doesn't break on them and that sort of thing are the sharps. Uh, the dressmaker sharps straight pins and they're wonderful. Okay, so now we're going to start out an inch from the seam. Uh, about that inch, inch and a half is fine. Again, we're stitching in the ditch. Go forward. Okay, here we go. Now, like I said, with something like this, you definitely want to take your time. And because I didn't pin, like I normally do, every few inches, I'm having to go to the underside and tuck it under, hold it in place, and just let the machine do the work. So, I want to make sure I have it turned under on the other side all the way around. That's why I say pin it, and I didn't do it. <laughs> This way, I know it takes a little longer for me to do it this way, but I know your time's precious too. So, trying to make sure that I get this baby tucked under, tucked into bed, as they said. Okay. Okay, can't take anymore. I got a pin. <laughs> it's about as a natural uh, occurrence as possible. Come on, get in there. Now I'm going to do this. Because I didn't pin it all the way around, I can pull this up. Turn the wheel towards me. Pull it out of here. And snip that baby right there. And then just go back and make sure I pin it. <laughs> I can't help it. Pins are your friends. Don't let anybody tell you any different. But when you're doing something intricate and doing reversible, it's kind of intricate. Honestly. I went to. I did it again, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Now, one thing you can do if you want to take a little extra time and you don't want to keep dealing with the pins is after you pin it like this and because these are dressmaker pins the sharps they'll either have the glass heads on them or just the little tiny metal heads you can take your iron and do a steam press it and then take the pins out and it'll stay it'll stay put it'll stay where it's supposed to and you don't have to worry about it i mean that's an extra step this way at least you can keep on sewing and you don't have to you know fuss with it as much it's not too bad. It's got a little ways to go across the back, but it's not that bad. Now, this size of elastic is up to you. Um, because of how much I added to the pattern width of the band, I did the same thing for the neck band portion. It goes around the back. And that's because that band has to be matched up to the headband in the front because you're sewing those two pieces together. So obviously they have to be the same width, finished width. So just keep that in mind if you do the two color bands, you know, if you're not um, making the standard one that's on, on the pattern where it's, it's not reversible at all, it's just one material um, with all, you know, another color on the inside. Um, but like I said, I, I like the idea of getting a, a two for one deal and this way you've got two looks. You can wear it with the camouflage side or you can wear it with the shiny, lovely seafoam green side. So I am maybe a little, a little glamour overkill, I guess. So I'm going to do this and after that. I'm going to show you what to do with the elastic um, and how to get that in there. You only need for this, if you're going to do the standard elastic version, uh, as on the pattern, an eight inch piece of elastic. Believe it or not, only eight inches is needed. 
because you have the flat headband portion plus, you know, from here. So eight inches stretches out a good ways. I forget how far eight inches stretches. I'll just see. And that's another way you can tell how, uh, how well, eight inches is what the pattern calls for. But if you want yours a little looser, what I would do is take a, uh, a piece of ribbon. Ah, dropping pins. That happens. I would take a piece of ribbon and put it behind my ear and behind this ear around the base of my head where I, where I want it to lay. Take that measurement and mark on a piece of elastic the size that I would need to stretch that far. I'm going to show you that uh, little trick here in a second. Okay, so that's that. All right. So what you do is an eight inch, eight inch non-roll elastic. This is non-roll. It has the little ridges in it. That's what you want to get. This is your regular elastic. After a while, this dies big time. If you see a yellowed package on the shelf, don't buy it. That means the elastic's drying out. Okay, so eight inches. Let's see how far eight inches stretches. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight. Eight inches is here. I make other items with that have elastic in them, and I have a one size fits all steam gown that I make. And uh, that's cool because I know exactly how far that elastic's gonna stretch. Okay, eight inches. Let's see, we're gonna lay this down and see. Hold it right there. We're gonna take the other end and we're gonna stretch it out. Wow, 14 and a quarter inches. This stretch is 14 and a quarter inches. So you got 14 and a quarter inches to work with. Now, to use the elastic puller, and like I said, these things are awesome. You put it in one side, a little slot. Take the other one, put it through the other side. This is to lock it in so it doesn't come undone for you. Like that. That's not going to go anywhere. Okay. When you go to put it in your bonnet, where that hole is that you left, you're going to fish it through all the way through but as you're fishing that end through first thing you're gonna do take this end and where your seam is slide that in there about that far about about a quarter inch once you have that in there at that quarter inch and you've already started pulling this through the other side what you want to do well I would pin it here first from the outside in other words let me do it this Take this out and show you. Put this, this in here. I may have made this a little too snug. Yes, I did. But anyhow, that's my fault. I'm gonna take it out of here. I can at least show you. You can always use a big safety pin. Sometimes I end up doing it one of these, but anyway. You're going to put this elastic this end in that little casing area and you're going to lay it flat and you're going to feel with your fingers and you can feel that it's laying inside flat past the seam line and when it's past that seam line your next step is take your sewing machine and you're going to stitch in the ditch here. That secures the elastic on this side. Then you feed it through your casing all the way around to the other side. And you're gonna feed it past this seam on this side, just like on the other side. Stitch in the ditch again. And that way your elastic is in there. Okay, but it doesn't gather the front. That's what allows the front to stay flat. And this one, the same thing. The elastic is stitched right here and it's stitched over here on this seam. And that's it. Um, 
but if you wanted to do the ribbon where you pull it, you know, like gather it yourself at the back side, um, I'm going to do one of those. I'm going to put one together and show you how to do that one. It'll be a shorter video, I promise, but um, I'll have it all done except for that part. So that'll be a kind of a part two and a half, <laughs> I guess. Um, there are so many different variations that you can do uh, on this, and what I'll do is I will, on the part two and a half, I'll have us finish this up. Um, but I wanted to give you the visual of where to put the elastic, how to stitch it, bring it around, stitch it again. And um, that's when you end up with a look like this. Nice flat uh, headband portion on the front. Gather it in the back to hold the hair. And, um, and you got to see one of my vintage sewing machines. Pretty cool. Um, the great thing about the vintage ones, they didn't have a whole lot of fancy stuff. Um, some of them had some, but most of them were straight and zigzag. And that's all they needed back then. They, they weren't into embroidery stitches unless they embroidered by hand. And uh, But then you have the ones that have the, um, the cams, and I have a couple of those. So maybe next time we'll do some uh, camming. Um, this way you get to see different machines and maybe you might want to get into vintage because I can tell you one thing, if these things have been around since the 60s, they're going to be here long after I'm gone. <laughs> All right, everyone, I really do appreciate if you like my video. And again, I'm sorry that it's taken me so long to get back into it. I do have a lot of stuff going on and I have a lot of stuff I want to share. So um, any questions or comments, please enter them below. Click subscribe, keep me going. <laughs> Because um, this is something I enjoy and I love sharing. Sharing an art, sharing a craft, and getting other people excited about maybe doing it too. All right. Well, this is Sue from So What and More. And we're my Glamour Bonnets and happy sewing. <laughs>